Well, good morning, good afternoon, evening, wherever everybody is who signed into this. Thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Brian Benish uh, with DSIAC. Uh, I'm just going to spend a minute here giving a quick introduction to who we are, what we do, and you know why we're hosting this um, presentation. I'm happy to have Kaiser here to to deliver it, and um, I'll try to keep my time short so that he can uh, get to his presentation. Um, just quickly of, of who we are. Uh, so DSIAC, uh, we are a, a DOD entity. We're under DTIC, the Defense Technical Information Center, um, ultimately to support the DOD research and engineering community um, by conducting information research on a variety of technical topics within our, our domain, the defense systems domain, um, in which there are we have, we have 10 chartered focus areas. Um, we have technical staff on board um, with us to help you um, in the DoD research engineering community to help you find the information you need on whatever technical topic you're working. Um, we're trying to help you help give you a head start um, on the work that you're doing. We want to make sure that there's not redundant work being done uh, throughout the DoD community. We want to help um, make sure that you're able to um, collaborate with anybody else doing similar work and um, and then help stimulate any sort of innovation in the work that you are doing. So to that end, uh, we host webinars like these to um, essentially kind of push out an awareness of the information of the work being done in the defense community. Um, and, and so we're happy to have um, um, Kaiser here to help uh, to present the work that he's been working on. Um, and so the one quick bit before we jump into his presentation, a little logistics for the webinar. Um, for those who are um, part of the web platform of this, you'll be able to submit um, questions to us that we can get to at the, the Q&A portion. So after the presentation, we'll um, entertain some questions. So if you are in the web platform, you should see at the very top of the screen, um, a little kind of speech bubble. It says view audience questions if you were to hover over it. Uh, if you click that and then add a new question, that'll put your question in queue. So at any time during the presentation, um, I'd encourage you to, to put your question in there, put it in queue, and then we'll take them in order as they're received at the end of the presentation. Um, just want to distinguish that from the uh, the chat. If you're in the web platform, it there shows that there's an attendee chat, a presenter chat. Um, want to kind of dissuade you from entering your question there. Um, if you do have a, a question, you can go ahead and just file it again in the a Q and A portion, and we'll get to it at the end. Uh, and I think that's pretty much all that I wanted to cover. So without further ado, um, Kaiser, the floor is yours. All right, um, Brian. Th thank you. Um, just wanted to kind of check with you the um, uh, control of the presentation here. Um, I think I I, uh, I do not have it at this point, but um, while we figure that out, um, um, I'm just going to do a quick um, introduction of myself. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody, or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Um, um, my name is Kaiser Manzer. I'm a research physicist at the Engineer Research and Development Center, ERDIC in Vicksburg, Mississippi. A little background on me, um, I have a Bachelor's of Science in Physics with a second major in Mathematics from the University of Memphis, and I'm pursuing my Master's of Science in Applied Physics from Johns Hopkins University with a planned graduation in May 2021. Um, my focus is on understanding the physics behind remote sensing. Um, I also have a Bachelor's in Science uh, in Information Technology and a Bachelor's of Science in Workforce Education and Development. Um, I served on active duty in the U.S. Navy as an Iraq first mate, uh, which is a weather observer, and in the U.S. Army as an intelligence analyst for G2 3rd uh, Infantry Division, Fort Stewart, Georgia, and deployed from, uh, to Iraq from 2005 to 2006 in that respect. Um, I graduated from the U.S. Army Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia, and commissioned as an Air Defense Artillery Officer. I deployed to Iraq from 2008 to 2009 as an Air Defense Artillery Officer where I served in roles of a platoon leader and executive officer with um, Delta Company 24488, Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, as a captain in the U.S. Army Reserves, I served as a company commander for Charlie Company 431st Civil Affairs Battalion and intelligence officer for 467th Engineer Battalion and an intelligence officer for Detachment 6 3100 Strategic Intelligence Group in Millington, Tennessee. So today, um, I will give an overview of radar and SAR and discuss the factors affecting radar images in general and SAR images in particular. 
One of these factors is the effects of surface roughness on synthetic aperture radar or SAR images. An understanding of the effects of surface structure on SAR imagery will lead us to examine how we can affect SAR images by controlling surface roughness. See if I can move this slide. Um, Brian, I'm, un I'm unable to move at this point. Okay, hey, I'll go ahead and uh, progress them for you. So just let me know um, when you want to progress them and then I'll, yeah. I'll handle okay. it for you. Yeah. Next slide, please. So um, we will define radar and synthetic um, after radar SAR. After an overview of how SAR works, we will then talk about the factors that affect SAR images, which include material properties, radar viewing angle, and surface geometry, and surface roughness. Uh, we will then focus our discussion on surface roughness and further discuss the effects of surface roughness, examine how it affects image appearance in SAR. Now, the condition of a surface, either smooth or rough, results in specular reflection or diffuse reflection and is determined by the Rayleigh criteria or the Fraunhofer criteria. We will discuss these criteria in later slides. By examining the physics behind how surface roughness contributes to the image appearance in SAR, we will be able to determine the best mechanisms to implement that can enhance or degrade images in SAR. Next slide, please. Um, the term radar itself was coined in 1940 uh, by the United States Navy as an acronym for radio detection and ranging. Now, uh, radio wavelengths are the longest wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum past infrared. Radar frequencies range from about 0 0.230 gigahertz to about 40 gigahertz and are divided into various bands as shown in the images here on the screen. Some of the more common radar bands for military purposes include C, X, and KU bands. Next slide, please. Okay, so the basic principle of any imaging radar is to emit electromagnetic waves in the microwave part of the spectrum towards the surface or object on the surface. The microwaves reflect back from the surface to the radar and this backscatter is time delayed. Now the resulting image is built up from the strength of the backscatter waves and the time delay. The roughness of the surface and the material properties of the surface largely affect backscatter and the strength of the reflected waves respectively. Now, microwave wavelengths range from about 0.03 centimeters to about 30 centimeters um, uh, in, in their wavelengths. Radar signal loses energy at its, as it travels towards the surface at a rate equivalent to the beam width and is defined as the wavelength divided by the antenna size. So for a real aperture radar, by the time the radar signal reaches the ground, it has spread considerably. For example, the signal wavelength is 10 uh, centimeters and the antenna diameter is 10 meters. The beam width uh, would be 1 over 100 radians, or approximately 0 0.6 degrees. So let's say that the uh, altitude of the radar is 1,000 kilometers. So with a beam width of 0 0.6 degrees, the angular resolution, which is the distance between targets that can be distinguished from each other, is calculated to be 10 kilometers. And so the image resolution is insufficient for most applications. Now, SAR uses radio waves that are in the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It is a side-looking radar, which means that the platform that could be an aircraft or satellite travels forward in the flight direction, and the nadir is directly beneath the platform. The radio waves are transmitted obliquely at right angles to the direction of the flight, illuminating a swath. Now here, I'll, I'll give some uh, definitions, and uh, we'll see where SAR falls into this. Range refers to the across track dimension perpendicular to the flight direction, and azimuth refers to the along track dimension parallel to the flight direction. SAR process improves the resolution along this track. A swap width refers to the strip of the Earth's surface from which the data are collected. So SAR uses one antenna, and the SAR processor stores all of the radar return signals as amplitudes and phases for the time period the target is within the radar beam. These signals are then combined to produce the final image. For example, for a target like the ship shown on the right, the backscatter echoes are recorded for each of the transmitted pulses from the radar, as shown in the image with A, B, C, and D. Now, the pulses are recorded as our aircraft continues to move 
forward until the ship leaves the beam width of the radar. The radar images every point on the ground in the path of its swap many times. Now, the distance from the specific point to the radar constantly and predictably changes as the radar passes overhead. But through computer processing, it is possible to compensate for the phase history of each pulse recorded for a point and thus creating a synthetic aperture. The resulting image resolution can then be improved theoretically to one half of the antenna's diameter. So if the diameter is 10 meters, as stated in the example above, the resolution would be five meters in SAR. And if the diameter of the antenna is say six meters, the resolution would be three meters. The azimuth resolution is independent of radar height. So with a smaller antenna, finer resolution can be acquired using the SAR process. The above discussion suggests that to get a better and better resolution, the radar length should be as short as possible. But there is a limitation, that is to form a complete ap aperture without aliasing longer wavelengths back to shorter wavelengths, the radar must be pulsed every L over two distance or shorter, where L is the length of the radar. This is known as the pulse repetition frequency or PRF. Now, aliasing is, a, uh, is an effect that causes different signals to become indistinguishable when sampled. This career frequency is given by two times the velocity of the aircraft or satellite divided by the length of the radar or 2B or rail. Another limitation for PRF is the speed of the data link from the aircraft to the ground or satellite to the ground. So the SAR process techniques allow us to be able to achieve resolutions which would require real aperture antennas so large as to be impractical. Some of the advantages of the radar wave are that radar waves can penetrate clouds, fog, dust, and other atmospheric obstructions. So in essence, SAR creates a large aperture through the motion of the platform. Next slide, please. Hey guys, I just want to make sure I'm on the right slide. You you uh you're still on this this fifth slide here. Yeah, I'm on slide uh slide five. Yes, yes. Yep, that's correct. Perfect. So now that we have discussed an overview of how SAR works, uh, we will discuss material properties, radar viewing angle, and surface geometry that play an important role in the SAR image appearance. Uh, the material properties are affected by the relative permittivity and permeability of the material. When a material is subjected to an external electric field, the molecules of the material tend to align themselves in the direction of the electric field. The absolute permittivity is defined as the measure of the permittivity in a vacuum, and it is how much of the resistance is encountered when forming an electric field in a vacuum. Relative permittivity, or dielectric constant, is defined as the permittivity of a given material relative to that of the permittivity of vacuum, or absolute permittivity. So it is the resistance of a material uh, to form an electric field inside the material relative uh, to the resistance to form an electric field in a vacuum. Uh, that's, of course, in the presence of an external electric field. Permeability is the ability of the material to form magnetic fields inside the material. Now, here on the um, far right, you can see of the image, figure 4A, uh, it shows the effects of surface, rough, uh, surface structure on radar reflection. Uh, a, a smooth surface produces specular reflection, as shown by the middle green line, and results in the image appearing darker whereas a rough surface produces diffuse reflection, where more of the reflected radiation backscatters to the radar, resulting in a brighter appearance and is shown by the green rays to the far left. The rays to the far right show the result of a double bounce effect. Now, figure 4B uh, in the center um, shows radar viewing and surface geometry. They account for local instant angle, uh, which is marked by A. Uh, which is the angle between the EM wave and a line perpendicular to the slope at the point of instance, and the look angle B, which is the angle between uh, the vertical plane passing through the radar antenna and the line between the antenna and the target. Now, if A is equal to B, then the resulting reflection is specular, resulting in darker image tones. For slopes facing towards the radar, if A is not equal to B, the reflected waves are strongly backscattered. Uh, resulting in bright image tones. Figure 4C at the very bottom 
um, shows the orientation of the transmitted radar beam relative to the direction or alignment of linear features on the surface. A near perpendicular orientation of the look direction to the feature will cause a large portion of the incident wave to be reflected back to the sensor and the feature will appear brighter. An oblique orientation of the look direction to the feature will cause a small portion of the instant wave to be reflected to the radar and the uh, feature will appear darker in tone. But some of the other effects of surfaces on radar images are shadowing, foreshortening, and layover that also determine how an object looks on radar. Now this um, radar image shown here in, this, uh, in, in the right uh, is a radar image of a KA band airborne SAR image where the effects of specular and diffuse reflection can be seen. The scene shows four to five buildings where we can see a number of vehicles parked as well. Now the uh, darker and lighter tones present in the scene are a result of the factors mentioned above. For example, the bright line uh, that we see here are barbed wire, which cover the northeast and east of the building in the middle of the image. As uh, we can see, these parts of the image are brighter in the tone and than the other structures. One of the reasons is the diffuse reflection and double bounce effect mentioned earlier, as barbed wires are uh, multifaceted and are mostly made of steel. The darker areas, such as the sides of the buildings, uh, could be due to the multiple reasons, including smoothness of the surface, radar viewing angle, and orientation of the transmitted beams, as mentioned above. Another example in this image is that of shadowing. Now, shadowing occurs when an object blocks the path of the reflected radar waves. In this image, we can see that the trees to the left are blocking the part of the rooftop of the building to the far left, and the tree uh, in the middle is blocking the part of the ground underneath, uh, underneath it. A radar image may look like an optical image, uh, but it is more like a 2D hologram and can provide much more information. The ability of radar waves to penetrate clouds, fog, dust, and other atmospheric obstructions, along with the fact that a radar system, especially an active radar system, can be used day or night and does not rely on an outside source of light like the sun to operate, makes it an uh, ideal to use in most environments and at uh, any time of the day. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we will discuss the effects of surface roughness uh, on image appearance in SAR. Surface roughness is the average height variations in the surface cover from a plane surface. As we saw in the radar image earlier, the surface roughness or smoothness can produce bright or dark tones in a radar image. Of all the factors mentioned above, this factor can be adjusted readily on a manufactured object to create a smoother rough surface the result of which would be to be able to manipulate a scene that would result in a particular SAR image. Next slide, please. Okay, um, a surface appears smooth to the instant radar wave if the height variations are less than the radar wavelengths. This results in specular reflection with more of the energy going away from the radar receiver resulting in a darker tone in the image. Surface appears rough to an instant radar wave if the height variations are close to or larger than the uh, radar wavelengths. This results in diffuse reflection with more of the energy going towards the radar receiver, resulting in a brighter tone in the image. Next slide, please. So the Rayleigh or Fraunhofer criteria describe the relationship that must be satisfied for a surface to appear smooth to the instant uh, radar wave. Here, delta H is the height variations as shown previously, lambda is the wavelength of the incoming radiation, and theta is the instant angle. Material properties like permittivity and permeability determine the strength of the backscatter waves, while the surface smoothness or roughness determine how much of the reflected radiation makes it back to the radar receiver. So, if we're able to direct the radar waves away from or towards the radar antenna, regardless of the strength of the backscatter, we can enhance or degrade the image appearance in SAR. So if we know the wavelength of the radar wave and the angle at which the instant wave is interrogating the surface, we could design surfaces with the height variations that could produce the desired bright, brighter or darker tones in SAR image. 
This method could be used for both civilian and military purposes where detection or identification or lack thereof is of importance. Next slide, please. So this slide shows one way of being able to measure uh, the height variations in a surface. Stylus profilometer measures surface roughness and consists of a detector and a sample. The detector determines the location of the points on the sample. The apparatus moves by either moving the sample holder or the probe to get the measurements. This could be used to test small samples of a manufactured surface for the desired height variations, delta H, before uh, producing uh, larger surfaces for use in a field environment. Now, there's also another technique called optical profilometry in which light is used instead of physical probe. In this technique, light is directed in a way that it can detect the surface in 3D. Next slide, please. Okay, so today I discussed SAR and the factors which affected SAR images. I also described how variations in surface structures can affect SAR images and how this knowledge can be used to develop surfaces that could produce the desired radar return. Surface structures appear smooth or rough to an incoming radar wavelength based on the Rayleigh or Fraunhofer criteria. And by being able to develop and synthesize surfaces based on the definition of smoothness described by these criteria, we can affect the appearance of images in SAR. We also briefly mentioned a couple of the apparatus that can be used in the laboratory environment to determine the desired height variations in the surface before larger scale production for a field environment. Well, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you to all for making the time to attend this presentation. Uh, I can take uh, any questions at this time. Perfect, thank you, Kaiser. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and progress your slides a little bit just so everyone can uh, see the other ones, although not blacking out on me. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, these are my uh, references here. Yep, so the references are available. Um, I did send a message out to everybody who's dialed in or who's up, uh, can see this in the web platform. But uh, the slides, if you did want to download them, they're available on the, the DSIX.org website um, under this webinar's webpage. So you can get, download them um, for further use. And then I'll just leave your contact uh, information up here on the last slide while we, um, okay. before we jump into the Q&A. Yeah, my, uh, okay. my email address is on but I will I can give that out um, it's yeah. basically my first name spelled here Q-A-I-S-A-R dot uh, Manzor M-A-N-Z-O-O-R at E-R-D-C um, dot D-R-E-N that's Delta Echo Romeo November dot M-I-L no mm -hmm. perfect yep and so um, we'll make sure so if, if someone is looking for that and didn't get down just let us know we can help get that to you um, and then a reminder here for the Q&A, uh, so we've got a little dialog box at the top of the web platform. Uh, you can enter your question there and, and we'll just, again, take them in order as they come. Got a few of them in, in queue, so let's just go ahead and jump in. And um, as we're talking through them, again, go ahead, if you want to ask a question, you're more than welcome to enter it there. All right, so first question is entered. Um, have you considered radar absorbing paint? That's the one that has been developed by this individual here. Um, can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time hearing. Yeah, no problem. It, okay, so it's also, you. have you considered radar absorbing paint? Okay, yeah. I, I see the question here saying, uh, have you considered radar absorbing paint uh, like the one um, I have developed? Um, you know, well, I mean, my uh, this research is uh, solely focused on um, surface structure, but, uh, you know, controlling uh, uh, the, the radar signatures with uh, surface structures. Um, but uh, uh, no, definitely, uh, I think uh, if we can combine um, um, paints, absorbing paints, along with um, signing various uh, um, uh, surfaces to uh, produce the specular or diffuse reflection, I think that would be a great combination. Um, I do similar work with, with IR uh, using paint, uh, but with, uh, with radar, the focus of this particular uh, uh, research uh, was just with uh, surface structures, but definitely, um, you know, uh, including paints, absorbing paints with it would, would definitely uh, make a huge difference. Okay, perfect. Thanks. All right. Uh, this next question um, and the one after are similar. I will answer them. So will the slides 
or the recording be available afterwards. Uh, yes to both. Uh, the slides are currently available. Um, again, it's on the dsiac.org website. If you um, find the webinar webinar section and, and find this particular webinar's web page, uh, they're immediately down, available for download from there. Okay, um, next question here. So what determines whether rally or Fraunhofer criteria should be used to determine delta age? Yep, um, both of them are pretty much do the same thing. And if you uh, look at the criteria, I think uh, the Fraunhofer criteria is just a little bit more stricter than the Rayleigh uh, criteria, but uh, either or um, uh, uh, can be used uh, for it. Uh, one is just a little bit more stricter. Most, most of the time, the Rayleigh cr uh, criteria is sufficient. Okay. Perfect. Um, we did just have a, uh, not quite a question, but a comment come through to us um, asking kind of for a, the, the, the script that went along with this. And um, I forgot to mention this earlier, but there, there is a article that um, Kaiser has published uh, with, through our website here, um, through the DSI website. So I'll, I'll make sure that, um, so it's linked on the webinar webpage, but we'll make sure that it's also included in a follow on email to all attendees. So um, as a sort of a thanks for attending, we'll include the link to where you can see the recording, but also include the link to the article, uh, the written article that goes along with this as well. Okay, uh, next question. Are there lateral dimensional constraints in addition to surface height in considering roughness? Yeah, with, with SAR, as, as we saw that uh, the, um, height, uh, the height of the radar uh, is uh, is not important um, because uh, uh, you know SAR in interrogates a surface multiple times as uh, as it's going um, over that um, uh, over the uh, the structure or the surface that you're looking at. Um, the um, uh, SAR basically will let me make sure that I um, get you the right answer for that. Yep. Yeah. So um, basically, SAR will go through the uh, uh, improves the resolution along the azimuth uh, direction, which is the long track dimension uh, or the parallel to the flight direction. So that's the that's the uh, dimension that um, uh, SAR improves um, uh, improves uh, the um, uh, resolution, uh, but it's not affected by the height uh, or, or lateral dimension of um, uh, of the radar. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, are you using these techniques currently to develop simulated targets? And if so, how is that research going? Yeah, uh, this research right now, uh, you know, I've just started doing the research on it. And, um, uh, you know, I'm looking uh, for collaboration uh, with the various folks uh, to, uh, to put these uh, ideas into practice at this point. Okay. Okay, next question was, uh, what kind of algorithm or test are you using to perform analysis of the optical profiling? Uh, optical for, for the um, uh, optical profilometer? Uh, again, yeah, uh, we, haven't, we haven't gone to that part yet. Um, uh, those are a couple of the techniques, um, uh, you know, that can be used uh, uh, for um, uh, determining the surface structures. But um, uh, no, uh, the, those uh, we haven't gone through that part uh, of the experiments yet. All right, next question here. So at a large angle, a smooth surface will result in a darker image than a rough image. But at a small angle, a smooth surface would result in a brighter image than a rough image. I guess correct. Is that <laughs> Uh, the the, um, the the brightness uh, or or darkness of the surface will will depend on uh, several of the factors. Uh, most of uh, most of it is uh, the surface structure itself. Uh, you know, like I mentioned, that that high variation um, in there because that's what determines how um, how much of the energy is directed uh, away from the radar and how much is directed back towards the radar. So um, uh, you know, uh, a larger angle wouldn't necessarily mean uh, that it would be darker. Um, uh, it, it, at that point, I think it would determine it would be determined by the surface structure. Yep. Perfect. All right. Let's see here, the next question. 
Um, how does one decide whether to use the Rally criterion or to use the Fraunhofer criterion when considering surface roughness? What about the spatial frequency of the roughness? Right. Uh, the Rayleigh criterion and uh, you know determines um, uh, the smoothness uh, that if a surface appears smooth. So um, as uh, I mentioned in the in, in the presentation, that delta H, if it's less than the um, uh, than the right side of that equation, um, where um, where lambda is the wavelength and theta is the instant angle, uh, then the then the surface appears smooth. So, um, you know, depending on the wavelength of the radar that you know that the surface is going to be interrogated with, um, uh, and uh, and the uh, and the angle, um, you, you know that's what's going to determine if if the right side of the equation is is greater than that delta H, uh, then it's going to appear smooth to uh, to the incoming uh, uh, to the incoming radar. Right. Okay. Okay, um, so saying here that uh, this individual, he's used uh, carbonyl iron in the paint, which addresses internal reflect or reflection, I suppose, to solve the radar due to the uh, porosity of the carbonyl iron particles. It's just a, a comment perhaps here. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, um, again, the, uh, yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> no, no, it, that's fine. I didn't know if you wanted to comment. I just see the next question is also related to there. Uh, any interest in the pain? I appreciate this and uh, comment here, but at the same time, let's try not to to make this too promotional about other applications. You can certainly email Kaiser if you have any uh, suggestions. Yeah, absolutely. I'm 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 uh, looking forward to hearing back from uh, from anybody that might be interested. Yep. Okay. Well, here's a question we have. So, if height doesn't matter for SAR all other parameters equal, then would remote sensors be as good as air breather sensors? Or would there be a significant design differences necessary to provide the same fidelity of SAR imagery? Yeah, um, can you give me an example of an air breather sensor um, so we can kind of compare that? I don't work with air breather sensors that much. Um, yeah, so on, you know, unfortunately, uh, air, so he's saying uh, airborne. Oh, so airborne sensors, maybe instead of air breather. Uh, it, so he's saying military speak here. So yes, Eric, I can see your uh, messages coming in. So that's good. So the clarification in saying that uh, air air breather sensors are referring to kind of airborne sensors. Yeah, air, 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 I mean, we would be seeing design different message versus speed. Airborne versus space sensors. Yeah, I, uh, I mean the, the reason why the reason why SAR um, uh, SARS uh, radars are, are smaller because uh, you know it has to be it has uh, because of the payload issues in in satellite and and on aircraft right and so the algorithms in SAR uh, is what makes SAR SAR um, uh, you know just by being able to interrogate a surface multiple times from different angles. Um, then using uh, various different uh, um, uh, algorithms uh, to to basically process that uh, that information. Uh, that's that's what makes SAR. Now the SAR processing steps they include um, uh, you know they can be broken down into like three small um, small different um, subsets. Uh, the first is uh, polar form formatting, uh, which is to take a large data set. Which has been collected on a polar grid, and um, it accurately uh, interpolated uh, to a Cartesian grid. Um, so this operation is, is performed in the, in the phase space. Now uh, the, the second part of the SAR processing uh, then is uh, to perform a very large 2D uh, FFT, which is fast Fourier, uh, Fourier transform, uh, to convert the SAR data from phase space to real space. And then finally, the SAR image uh, uh, needs uh, enhancement to correct for errors due to uh, effects like airplane motion and platform jitter. So um, the data by itself, um, uh, you know, it, it's it's not what makes SAR SAR. It's the, it's the processing capability of SAR that uh, uh, makes it a lot more useful. I hope that, that answers that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep, and, and just to clarify, uh, he had said that the distinction was that he's referring to remote sensors as being satellite, 
as opposed to airborne sensors, you know, on an aircraft. Yeah, I mean, SAR, SAR has been used in both satellite and airborne, so, um, uh, you know, so you can use it in both. Okay. All right. Um, next question here refers to a previous question. So let me see if I can, I'll, I'll read this and see if I can dig through the previous questions to make sure we can get the connection in case you uh, don't make it immediately. But um, just saying that the lateral dimension question previously was referring to lateral dimension of the surface structure. That is the width or radius of the surface features, not the height, not the, the depth, delta H. Okay. So let me yeah. Uh, Surface structure, the, the surfaces themselves, uh, you know, will, will play uh, an important role in how um, the image looks in SAR as well. You know, like I mentioned, uh, some of the uh, some of the effects of surfaces like shadowing, uh, like we saw in there, uh, there's others uh, called foreshortening and layover. Uh, now, foreshortening occurs when the radar signal arrives from one point of the target to an adjacent point on the target in a very short amount of time. So, for example, um, uh, let's say we have a mountain. Uh, and this this will result result in the mountain to appear steeper uh, with a thin uh, uh, with a thin bright edge. Uh, so uh, sensor look angle affects shortening, um, and at larger look angle will decrease uh, the effect of that. And layover is just a, just an extreme example of foreshortening. Mm -hmm. in, in, in that the object is so tall that the radar signal reaches a point uh, further away first uh, before the near point. Uh, and this this causes the return from the farther point to be received back at the radar first, and it and it obscures the closer point. So, so yeah, the the the, the latter dimension in, in that sense it would make a it make a difference uh, on on how it appears in in, um, uh, in SAR images. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, and I just got a note here from about to disregard the next question, but it was just sort of a comment about the. Uh, uh, employing the the raunchy test for optical profiling. I'm not sure if that's relevant or not. So that that takes us to the end of the questions. Um, I'll kind of leave us here for just a, a moment or two. If anyone else wants to drop one in um, before we before we end today, um, but I certainly appreciate everybody attending thus far and all the great questions that have been asked. I I personally think that the Q and A portion is kind of the most valuable. It allows you to um, kind of throw questions at the presenter and pick their mind a little bit and, and have some some sort of engagement and collaboration, you know, as best we can over this platform. All right. Great, Brian. Uh, well, yeah, at the end, I would just like to thank um, uh, thank you and everybody else at the Defense Systems Information Analysis Center and, uh, of course, also my chain of command for their support uh, in the development of this presentation. And, and I truly appreciate everybody's time and their questions. Yep, absolutely. We very much appreciate you uh, delivering this and everyone attending. Again, we'll make this uh, presentation all, all available. Um, uh, well, it, the presentation itself are, is immediately available, but it has been recorded. So we'll uh, get that information out as well once it's ready. So thank you, Kaiser. Thank you, everybody else. And have a great rest of your day. Thank you.